Right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. As you may be aware, since August is a very popular month for holidays, we're using this time to rerun some of our most popular webinars. So today we're showing you our top 10 tips for financing NAV. So as many of you know by now, my name is Adam and I'm part of the Metaphorics account management team. I'm joined this morning by Pauline, who lots of you will know from the training and uh, the support desk. So I'll hand over to her in just a second and she'll take you through the agenda for this morning. If you've been on any of our webinars before, you'll know how we do things, but if you haven't, we ask that you direct any questions to me once the webinar is over. So towards the end of the presentation, I'll put my contact details up on the screen, so let me know if you have any questions. It's just a way to save some time and make sure we don't overrun. Uh, a recording of this webinar can already be found online, uh, which we ran earlier on in the year, but we will be recording this one too, just for good measure. So all in all, we're looking for this webinar to last around 45 minutes. So if you're all set, Pauline, yeah. it's over to you. Thank you, Adam, and welcome again to you all. We're going to start our top 10 tips for financials by looking at the financial statements. Historically, NAV has never provided standard P&L and balance sheet reports sort of out of the box. But this all now changes in NAV 2018. Financial statements are now easy to produce. And something that isn't a new feature in NAV but is often forgot is the ability to create standard journals and these allow you to save your journal lines for reuse later. And with journals in mind, we will pay a visit to the recurring journals. Recurring journals not only allow us to save the content of the journal lines, but also there is a lovely functionality that allows us to use formatting syntax so that you never have to worry about changing those posting dates or document numbers again. Fed up with writing off those customer underpayments, Payment tolerance is the answer for your, to your prayers. And the payment journal report now helps you speed up the payment approval process. And of course, these sessions are never the same if we don't include a section on filters, variables and wildcards, which allow us to get to that one piece of information that is really important to us. And after creating all these wonderful filtered lists using our filtering skills, we can have a look at how we can save those lists for future use. And we will even create our own navigation button on our home screen in which to save them. If you have customers that repeatedly buy the same things, then recurring sales lines is for you. The recurring sales line function will speed up the creation of those repeat invoices. Our penultimate top 10 tip is report scheduling. There are a number of reports in NAV uh, that take quite a while to run. The new report inbox from the role centre allows a user to set up reports to run either at a quiet time or indeed overnight. And last but not least, we can check from within NAV if our vendors and customers have provided us with a valid VAT number through the validate VAT registration process. So let's go and see how we achieve all of these. Our number one is financial statements. Financial statements are now auto-generated using the account schedules that we all know and love, but are based on our existing chart of accounts. There are two new fields within our GL account, and they are the account category and the account subcategories. And if we have a look at those in a bit more detail, the account categories themselves are predefined within NAV and they come into uh, assets, liabilities, equity, income, cost of goods sold, and expense. So they are preset, but below them is the account subcategory, and those are predetermined determined by. Uh, yourselves. So within your assets you can subdivide them into the subcategories that best fit how you want to report. What is important as I say with these uh, account categories and subcategories they are linked automatically to our account schedules. Within our account schedules now you will find that there are a number that are preceded by an M and these denote that they are the system-derived account schedules. If we have a look at our 
income and go to our edit account schedule you'll notice that there is a warning telling us that it is a system driven account schedule and that anything I might change manually i.e. from the account schedule itself may be lost when future changes are made to our chart of accounts. So we'll just have a look at the account schedule and you'll see that it is very much driven by those account categories and the subcategories within those. So what I'm going to do is to show you how that actually works. I'm actually going to create a new income category. I come to my edit list at the top. I can simply click on new. I'm just simply going to call it top 10 tips. And you'll notice, of course, in the GL accounts that fall into that particular category and subcategory, there is nothing there at the moment because, of course, I haven't allocated those to a GL account at the moment. From this, I will just say generate the account schedule. And now when I go to those account schedules again and go to my income, we can see now that our top 10 tips is indeed present on that account schedule. To activate that, we need to go back to our chart of accounts. I will simply just create a new GL account, create a number, for example, top 10 tips, again, pick up my category, which is income, and my subcategory which will be my top 10 tips that I've just created. I can say OK to that. And so now, if I come back to my account categories and I go to my income, I can see not only that top 10 tips there, but also the fact that I've now added that GL account in on my chart of accounts. So anything that is now recorded from a GL posting point of view will be picked up on our account schedules. So that means that every time I make any change to my chart of accounts, then this setup will pick up that change and make sure that our account schedules are always up to date. So nice way of having some standard reports coming out of NAV based on our own chart of accounts. Next in line, we have our general journals. So I'm going to go to our general journals here and I'll just use my default general journal, edit that. Now, this part of the session is about how we can save these journal lines for use at a future date. To save time, I have created some line entries here, and we can see that I've got some uh, payroll details, posting to the various GL accounts required, and coming out of our bank account. So what I can do here is actually save that journal because I post my payroll journal every week or every month that it might be. So I can utilize the get and the save standard journal on my home ribbon at the top. So in this case, I'm going to save my standard journal. I can give it a code, so I could say payroll, it might be monthly, it might be weekly. And what I want to call it. And then I have an option as to whether I want to save the amount that is on the journal lines. No right or wrong on that. If I click the box that says save amount, then the lines will be repopulated when I get that standard journal with the amounts as per on the screen at the moment. If I don't tick that box, then they will come through empty. So I'm going to save that amount and say OK. 
what I can do now is I can just simply post my journal. Oh, I have a little numbering issue here, but of course another nice feature is the ability to be able to renumber our documents. So I can use on my actions ribbon the renumber document numbers. That has now changed and so now I can just come back and I can post my journal. So actually that is another top tip, the renumbering our journal lines. That journal has now been posted but I now come to my next period and I want to post those entries again. This time I simply get my standard journals and I've got a couple set up at the moment and there's that payroll one that we just created. So I bring those through and because I did tick that box to save the amount it has been populated with the amount on the lines. Of course it is now just a working document so I can simply come in and amend the values as necessary. Another little feature though that uh, is often forgotten about is the ability to use Excel to help us create our journal lines. So I'm just going to just highlight that first line and I'm going to right click and copy rows and then I'm going to come to Excel, go to blank workbook and just paste that information. The reason I do it that way rather than uh, send to Excel is because I want to make sure that I've got my headings as I want to see them and then I can just use this format as a format for importing or bringing back new lines if I prefer to create them outside of NAV. In my example here I'm going to copy that cell and I'm going to use Excel functionality to increment my document number for me. I can also copy my account type if I wish or I could manually type that in copy my GL account and my description and my values just to prove that I can type it in in lowercase or uppercase and enter my balance account highlight my line using control C to copy that over to my general journal. So I've come to my general journal line, I can come down to my next line, right click and paste row, and there is my line populated. Obviously if I had more lines on my spreadsheet then all those lines would be populated for me. If this was a line that was relevant to this particular save journal, i.e. the payroll journal, then I can simply go back on my ribbon again, do save as standard journal. This time, instead of giving it a new name, I can just pick up my payroll journal that I've already created. I can still tick the box to say yes, I still want to save those amounts. And what I'm actually doing here is adding to this journal. So as you go through your monthly postings or whatever, you can always add to your existing save journals and therefore when I say OK it's telling me that that payroll uh, save journal already exists and do I want to overwrite it so I will say yes that has now been saved again so we can carry on with adding lines to our journal as required of course once it's a working document is there as entries the next time that I don't want to post then after I have populated my lines, I can simply delete those lines. There's just one more feature that I'd like to show you, and that is the feature of being able to use the amount fields in any document within NAV as a calculation field. So here we have our amount field. I am able to put in the multiply sign, for example, so if I wanted 25% of that. I can use the plus sign. 
So I just feel that that feature is often not even known about and it can be quite useful when you're creating your documents. So that's creating our journal lines, saving as a standard journal, exporting to Excel, adding information from there and copying it back into our journal lines and updating our journal. Next thing we're going to have a look at, which is our number three top 10 tip, is our recurring journal. On our recurring journal, it is very similar to a saved journal or saved standard journal, but there are some additional functionalities there which helps us going forward. We have a recurring method and that recurring method can either be fixed, which simply means the value on the line of the journal when it is posted, when the, the journal is repopulated again, that value will come back, a bit like that save amount tick box on our standard journal. The variable says bring the line back but without any value on it. Balance says simply take the balance of this account. You then have reversing fixed variable and balance and what happens on these is that it will post the journal line at the date in our case the month end date and then post a reversing entry on the next day so on our journal lines here it would be the first of the new month but this would work on any date within a given month then we have to submit a frequency of when we want our recurring journal to happen and this is very much based on the posting date that you have specified on the lines. To save us having to worry about whether we've got 28 days in a month, 29, 30, 31, what we can do is put in this little syntax here. And the way this works, if we look at that bottom line, just for ease, we've said post this on the 31st of May. So when this line is posted, I want the date to move on to the 30th of May. June. And this syntax here is telling the vision to do that. It's simply saying add a day to the 31st of May, so that takes us to the 1st of June. Add one month, so that takes us to the 1st of July. And then remove one day, so back from the 1st of July back to the 30th of June. And that will work, as I say, for any month within our calendar year. Just saves us having to retype or re-enter these dates. you notice on the document number there's a prefix there of percent and four. This is a variable syntax which allows us to instead of having to type in for example it's May's telephone charges in this case there are these percentages and they go from percent one percent four they simply just denote if I just pop that through to your screen here so if you use percent one within the document number then it will represent the current day so today we're posting it is Tuesday so percent one would reflect Tuesday percent two is the current week and this is based on weeks of the calendar Percent 3 is the current month number, i.e. 1 for January, 2 for February. Percent 4, which is what I'm using, is for the current month. So in this case, it will say May telephone charges, whereas the line above, it will say June based on that posting date. And percent 5 is the current period name. So that's pulling that off of your calendar setup. So we can utilise that within our document number. You'll notice I've also added it to the description. And the reason being is just that when you're in the ledger entries of your uh, GL accounts, it's, nice, it's quite nice to see that month name there. It makes uh, items stand out. So what else do we have on our recurring journal? You'll notice that I've got some set up as fixed and a couple set up as reversing fixed. 
but on this one I have actually got a variable and I don't actually have a value in there at the moment and that's because I want to show you something else, another feature of the recurring journal. If I was to type in say 2500 you'll notice that I have now got an amount being highlighted in the allocated amount here and that is because from this posting I want my telephone charges to actually be allocated across some of my dimensions. So if I go to the allocations button in my home ribbon I can see that I want 50% to go to admin, 15% to go to production and 35% of the value of the line to go to my sales department. The other thing just to highlight to you, you do have this expiration date. This can be quite useful when you have lines relating to things like for example uh, higher purchase. So you can enter an expiry date when that higher purchase contract runs out. You, As soon as that date is reached the division will stop posting that particular transaction. It just means that you can leave the line on the journal next time you get a, a new higher purchase agreement. Then you can just come back to the line, change the date and change the details of it. So what we must do now is we can just do our posting. And my journal has been successfully posted. You'll notice that the first four lines the date has now changed to the end of July. It was at the end of June when we started. The values have come through because they are fixed. Whereas on my variable line, it is still incremented my date for me as I wanted because it was May and we're now looking at June. But that value hasn't come through because I have set it up as a variable. Another nice thing from your recurring journal is if you go to the navigate button you can actually look at the ledger entries for that particular posting so you can see here there's our June rent come through with our June in our description as well as in the document number if we look at our reversing journal we can see that what has happened is for our June entries, we've got our posting, because this is a reversing journal, our posting is coming out on the 30th of June and has then has been reversed on the 1st of July, which is what you would be expecting. Okay, so from our recurring journal, lots of functionality that we can utilise if we require and it, of course it saves time when you have to run those journals monthly, weekly, whatever it might be. Our number four top 10 tip is our payment tolerances. So this is where you have a customer or customers that have sent you a payment for a particular invoice. Maybe the invoice was for X thousand pound and 24 pence and they have omitted to send you that 24 pence on that payment. How do you want to handle that? Do you want it to be written off or do you want to manually have to write that off at a later stage? Well, Nivision can help you there by using these things called payment tolerances. We'll first look at where we have this set up and this is in the general ledger setup. We can see on our close those for you. On our applications we can see on our payment tolerance we can tick a box that says do we want to be warned when on a payment or cash receipt journal that payment doesn't fulfill the actual cost on the invoice. And then we can also say where we want the payment tolerance to be posted. Do we want it to be against a tolerance account or a discount account and that is entirely up to ourselves. Within the general posting setups you will pick out 
the relevant GL account as to whether it is the tolerance account or that discount account. In terms of how we specify the details of what the tolerances are that are allowed, you'll notice here these fields are grayed so they're not editable because it is a function that needs to be run in order to set this up. To do that we can simply go to the actions ribbon we click on the change payment tolerance icon and here we have to specify what the details are of the payment tolerance that we're accepting and in this case I've said a payment tolerance of 5% and then to a maximum value of in this case 50 pence. You then say OK to activate that and it does tell you that you are going to now be changing all the entries for every customer and vendor that's not blocked so that it marks those outstanding invoicing saying that there is a tolerance of 50 pence uh, should that need to be actioned upon. So I'll just say yes to that. Our database is quite small so that's happened quite quickly. So we'll close that down and we'll go to um, one of my customers. I've got one here, Metaphorics as it happens. And we will go and create a sales invoice for them. Just create the line as you would do normally. Picking up my GL account and changing the description if I need to. I'm going to make that for £725 and then I can just post that invoice and I don't want to have a look at it, thank you very much. Um, but what I do want to do now is actually go and receive the cash on that. Very important that you specify the document type here. Also, I'll just change that date as well. We pick up the fact that we're looking at our customer and I'll pick up my Metaphorics account here. And then we just, as we would do on any application, go to the Applies Entry screen. There's my invoice. So again, I apply that as normal and say OK. Brings that value through to the lines for me. But in this case, our customer has sent us to £761, but has not sent the 25p. So I'm just going to change that value there and you'll notice that we get this dialog box and we're getting this warning because we ticked that box in the general uh, ledger setup to say that we wanted to see the warning. And we've got two options. We can either post the balance as a payment tolerance or leave the remaining amount. And the remaining amount is shown here as that 25 pence. So I want to post using that payment tolerance and so I will say yes. My balance account, bank and bank account number is populated on my journal so I can now just post that just as I would do normally. Come out of that screen. My cursor is still on metaphoric so I can now go to the ledger entries and you can see we have our invoice line which was the original value of 76125 and there is nothing outstanding on it, i.e. it has been all paid off. Our payment line, however, specifies that the original amount was 761, which indeed is what I ended up posting, against the amount of 76125. Uh, so let's just go and navigate on that entry and you'll notice we've actually got three general ledger entries. And when we go and have a look at that, we can see that that 25 pence, when I drill down into my GL account, has actually gone off and been posted to the payment tolerance granted account that I have set up in 
my general posting setup. So very quick way, very easy way in order for us to deal with those odd payments where the customer hasn't fulfilled all the payment in total. Moving on now to our next subject, which is our payment uh, prepayment report that we get from our payment journals. So I will just pop to pay journals using my search box. The scenario is that we have a, another party within our organisation that has to authorise those payments. So if we just go to our bank payments batch, we can use the suggest vendor payments routine as usual, specifying the date to which we want to run up to whether we want to skip exported payments so if someone's already done an export batch then we wouldn't want to include those we want to summarize per vendor because we want one entry in our bank account when we pay them i've got a number series set up on my batch so that has been populated here i'm using my bank account as my balance account so we populate our journal and at this point dependent on who is going to approve the payment for these particular vendors will depend on how we want to carry out this approval process if it's a user that uses now quite a bit then of course they could simply just come into the apply entries and decide which ones they're going to pay and which ones they're not however quite often the approval process is carried out by someone who's either not au fait with NAV or might not even be a user on the system. So now we have our new report which is called the Vendor Prepayment Journal and I'm just going to send that to PDF. Now we have our report that tells us the details, the vendor and all the entries that are being picked up this time. So in this scenario then our approver could come through, strike out those ones that aren't required to be paid this time. They can then give that report back to the user. What we'll do is we've got this entry here for 1100 odd pound. So the user would come back into their journal, would delete that value, and I always, always recommend that, come back to the apply entries. The applications are still there, but there's that one for that 1100 odd pound. Unapply that value, therefore the balance has now been reduced. Say OK to that, and now the revised value is brought back to the journal lines. If we hadn't have deleted that amount on that journal line, then it will still have read the 99,000, whatever it was, but just would have been applied against that entry. So as you can see, using that or having the ability to do the Prender vendor prepayment journal, that can speed up that process of getting those payments authorised. Okay, next on our list is our filtering and our syntax and variables that we can utilise within NAV to get to that one piece of information that we really need. We'll start off by using the type 2 filter that is present on all of our lists. I just happen to be on the customer list, but this applies to any list view that we're working in. I want to be able to pull out a particular or find a particular customer. Realistically, I'm not going to know, especially if it's just a numeric number, I'm not going to know those numbers. So I'm going to change that and the list that we view here, uh, all the fields that we see on our list view, I will change that to name and I'm simply just going to type in the letters LTD. 
and you can see that it's bought out limited where it is at the end of the name in these three instances and here oh, here also limited this filter is just looking for that string of characters anywhere in our list view however there is another view and I'm just going to remove that filter and show you the what's called the advanced filter within here these filters are a little bit more stringent shall we say on the uh, information that you provide just to show you if I were to change that to name and type in limited again I actually get nothing and that is because there is no customer with a name that has lowercase ltd in the first three characters of its name so it's you looking uniquely at where those characters are so some syntax that can help us is if we're not sure whether it's a capital or a lowercase letter then we can use the at sign and that simply says whatever characters follow this at sign then treat them both as uppercase and lowercase so if I press return or tab on that now I'm still not getting any entries because again none of our customer names actually begin with uppercase or lowercase limited so how do we define that there might be some other characters before the ones specified well that's using the wildcard asterisk and an asterisk denotes any number of characters can follow or be in front of the LTD so we'll try that and I've only got now this time two out of the what was it four that I had and that is because I have said that it ends with LTD whereas some of them I know ended with the full point well again you may or may not know that so you can simply use that wild card again and then that will bring in the full list as we saw when we used our search box at the top as well as being able to use our wild cards and use our asterisk there are some other uh, syntax that you can use because asterisk is denoting any character number of characters more than one in the case where we just want to replace be able to replace just one character because using the asterisk might again give us results that we don't want to do I'm just going to remove that filter and bring those all my customers back and one of our customers is the Canon group and Canon could be spelt in many ways and again it might be uppercase lowercase etc so to set that filter again I could use the uppercase or lowercase I could then use the asterisk because I know there's something before Canon but I don't know what it is and then I can type in Canon but that last character of the uh, after the N is I'm not sure whether it's A, E, I could be anything so to denote a single character I can use just the question mark so question mark is single character so I'm saying Canon and again it might be that I have some characters after the Canon and I know that it is because it's a Canon group so again I can utilize that asterisk wild card as you can see it's pulled out the Canon group because of the asterisk and just using that one character okay so what else can we do that's quite good but what if we've got multiple fields that we want to filter on again multiple fields we would have to use this advanced filters because the filter at the top of our list is just a singular filter so I've got some fields here that I could use so I'm going to use this customer discount group now the customer discount group I can see that we've got some 
populated and some that aren't. But the difference now in this field is because I'm picking up what is in effect a subtable, you'll notice that I have a look up to the right hand side, so it's not just a straight text field. So I can utilize the fact that it's, I just want the retail customers. And then perhaps within that, I only want those customers that have a posting group of, for example, EU. So again, I can pick up my posting group. And again, I've got that look up because it's a sub table. I can then bring up just those that have the EU. So that's filtering as far as alpha is concerned. But if we want to have a look at how we can filter dates, and to do that I want to show you a special filter that's particularly useful in the chart of accounts. Because in our chart of accounts we have our net change column and our balance at date fields. So this allows us to have a snapshot of the net change at a given period, but then give us our balance to date anyway. So to do that, again, I'm going to go to my advanced filter, but this time I actually want to pick up this limit totals to here. I'm going to add my filter, which is my date filter. In my Cronus database, excuse the dates, but it's just the way it is with Cronus. So I'm saying I want to look at the period of November in 2018. So as we know with dates, you don't have to put in the separators. You can just type it in full. So now I can see that if I look at my net change field, when I drill down, I am just looking at those entries that are for November, where of course with my balance, I'm looking at all the entries totally posted against that account. So while we're just looking at dates, I just want to add some more filters. But once we have set our filters and then we come out of our screen, then those filters are lost. And quite often we have filters that we want, might quite like to be able to use again. So to show you some more filtering on the dates, I'm first of all actually going to create a new button for me because I want to be able to save all my views in my navigation pane because sometimes your role center home list can be quite big dependent on what role center you're using. So we'll have a look at how we create a button so that we can save our views to our button. I can go to our little character at the bottom of our navigation pane and go to customize pane. Then I'm looking now at all the buttons that I have here and within each of the buttons it tells me what I'm displaying when I click on that button i.e. what's displayed at the top section. So if I want to create new I might call it uh, my lists or my reports. It's my role center. It doesn't impact on any of the users, so I can call it as I wish. I can choose an icon of my choice. So I will pick that one and say OK. Now the first rule to creating your new button is that you must actually add a selection before you come out of here. So I'll go to add and perhaps in my uh, financial management I want to go to my general ledger. I want to add geo budgets to my button. It's something that I have to do on a regular basis. So I just say OK to that. That now populates that for me. At this point, I can say OK. It tells me that the changes have been saved. And do I want to refresh my screen so that I can see that new button? And we can see here now in my navigation pane, I have my lists and I've got my budgets. So that has activated and I can always remove that later if I don't need it. We're still on filtering, if you remember. So let's have a look at how 
we can do additional filtering, filtering using our date capabilities. This time I'm going to go to uh, ledger entries because we get lots of entries in there. She says, but of course I happen to have picked a customer that doesn't have any, but that's fine. It is just a filtered view. And in this case, because my cursor was sitting on this particular customer line, then the view is filtered by that customer. So I can simply remove that filter and now I have all the entries for all the customers. So let's just explore what else we can do on these posting dates. So we can use additional syntax. For example, I can say I want all entries greater than 0111118, for example. So now I've got everything from November 18 onwards. Likewise, I'm sure you've already guessed, I can say less than. So now I'm getting in everything before the 1st of November. Another good one is, in fact, a very good one, is P. And P relates to the period at the moment. And the reason why that is such a good filter to use is that within here, it actually always is P. It will, when you tab out, populate with this period, i.e. this current month, but it is actually got a, a control character there of P. So that means that whatever period I am in when we move on to September, then it will always be relevant to our current month. So additionally, I want to add document type because this is going to be my list of sales for my current month. And again, we've got a look up on this one. It's giving us selections of what document types. So I probably would want to have just invoices and credit memos on my list. So now I have my filter that's set that's always going to be P, that I just want to have my invoices and credit memos. As I said earlier, if you navigate away from your list after putting your filters on, then those filters are lost. But, as promised, we can actually save our view. And by clicking on, and again, this applies to any list, list view that you might be working on. Click on the little blue banner at the top, then come down to Save View As. It asks us what do we want to call it. So I might want to say that this is um, this month's invoices, for example. Then I can choose where I want that list to be saved. In this case, I want it to go to the My Lists and I'll say OK. And again, it wants to refresh the screen for me. So when we come back, now when I go to my list, I've got this month's invoices. And when I click on it and I look at those filters, you can see that those filters are indeed saved with it. Again, it's a P. So when we come through to being in September, that will then be September invoices. So that's one way of getting new items onto a home page, onto our role centre. There's just one other area that I'd like to show you on this subject about getting things onto your role centre. That is how to not, as we've just done, add to lists, but add other entries to our navigation pane. In this case, I haven't got in my list here sales credit memos, so I'm going to navigate to the sales credit memos. And I'm going to take not the direct route here, I want to go to the menu list here. 
and the reason for doing that is from a list again from a menu list I have the ability to right click on a selection and then choose what I want to do. Dependent on what selection your cursor is on will depend what is displayed here. So in this case I can open, I can open it in a new window, I can go to customise navigation pane i.e. where we were just a second ago or I can add it to the navigation pane. Within this case I said I wanted to do my sales credit memos so I will add to the navigation pane. Again just do a quick refresh and now my sales credits are at the bottom of my list and of course I can go in navigation pane and I can move it up my list if I, if I wish to. But another nice way of getting entries onto your role centre making it really personal to yourself. Okay we're nearly coming to the end now but a few more to go. Our next subject is recurring sales invoice lines. So in our scenario here we have a particular customer that has repeat invoices time and time and time again. Again I'm going to just go to my PDF customer and of course this applies to any of the customers. We open up our customer cart. From our Navigate ribbon we have our recurring sales lines here. Once we can set up any number of different recurring sales lines and we can give it a title. So in this case I've set up two. I've got one that's set for bicycles. We have a, an item line and a freight charge line and one called office whereby we have just items for our office in terms of uh, chairs and desks etc. Okay so as I say we can set up as many as we want. Once we have done that against our customers to actually run that process just minimize that go to the create recurring sales invoices we pop in our date so it might be today then we specify our customer number I can set up the bicycle and say OK and it tells me that one invoice has been created I've got some options of how I want to go and see that invoice I can go to my fact box from my customer list and see my invoice there or indeed I can just go to my sales invoices from my list view. We can see there that's that new invoice that I've just created. It is now a working document. If I need to make any changes to this then I can certainly do them at this point of time. But of course it just allows you to create those invoices quickly and carry out the postings hopefully saving you some time. We are on our penultimate item which is our report scheduling. From our role centre we have report inbox here and this is where a user can set up reports to run today, overnight, next week or whatever it might be or even a repeat report that you create on a regular basis. To create the report in the first instance you go to show queue we create new we then have to tell the system which report it is that we want to run or well, one of the reports that always does take quite a while to run what well, dependent on what inventory you have is the inventory valuation report we have to say the earliest time in which we want to run this so date and time it's going to be today and my time looking at the time on my system here so if I say 11 11 because I want to do something else in the meantime I want to because this report has a request page I want to be able to populate my details here
and then if I wanted to do it as a recurring one then I can just tick the boxes here when I'm ready I set the status to ready here say OK and there it is now waiting to be run in the meantime because we're not at 11 11 yet I just want to show you our last top 10 tips that is based on our vendor I'll use vendors for a change it does still apply to our customer cards as well I'm just going to go to edit in this particular case we have a vendor called key performance but you'll notice in the search name it's actually star technology well this is because this vendor has informed us that they're running under a different name now but we've got the old name there for, for reference so what we can do now is we can come to our VAT registration number we can populate that and I've cheated because I've copied that you'll notice that when I click out of that field NAV is going out to the server which we have set up within NAV to do a check on that registration against the details of that vendor card it says if that registration number is valid do I want to update the name and that is because it was star technology and is now key performance so I can say yes and if I now drill down into those three dots within the VAT registration number field I can see that it has told me that it wasn't verified with the original name details but that it has now with the new one so that allows us because of course it is potentially illegal to utilize the uh, reverse VAT charge uh, unless you have got a valid VAT registration and that allows you to check as you're creating as you're creating your vendors so hopefully we are now past 11 11 so if I come back to my role center we can see that my report is indeed here so I can ask Nav to show me it and indeed there is my inventory valuation with my expected costs because I ticked that box for the dates as I specified well we have now come to the end of our finance top 10 tips I've hoped that you have enjoyed it and found something that will be useful for you going forward so I will now hand over to Adam cool thank you very much for that Pauline I hope you'll find that interesting and useful if you do have any questions please take a note of my contact details on screen now I'm more than happy to help you out with anything that you've seen this morning so give me a call or drop me an email. Be sure to check out the recordings of other webinars like this one on our videos page on the website. And don't forget that we are rerunning our Power BI webinar in a couple of weeks and that will be on the 21st of August. So again, thank you for being with us this morning. Have a great day and we'll see you very soon. Cheers, bye bye.